Welcome back to Personal Pension Radio. I'm Craig Strom. You heard the intro. I am the income engineer. I love this question that came in from listener Ralph in Salt Lake City. He emailed in uh, to Craig with a K at craigstrom.com. And his question was, should I buy a house at 25 years old? Now, those of you who've listened to the show, you know that I am actually a certified financial planning professional. And that means that I don't give out sound bite advice like Dave Ramsey. I actually am a practicing financial planner. So I need to know more before I can answer a big, huge question like how or if a 25 year old should buy a house. So I did, I reached out, I contacted Ralph and we went through and got some more detail. Okay, here's the backup, uh, the background. Ralph graduated from college magna cum laude with a degree in software engineering from Southern California. He was recruited right out of college by an international defense contractor located in Salt Lake City, in the Salt Lake City area. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I live here in Southern California and a lot of uh, California-based uh, companies and tech companies from around the country, but even from California, are moving to Salt Lake City and out of California. Uh, so he was recruited shortly after graduating college right to Salt Lake City. They actually paid for his move and gave him a $3,000 signing bonus. This kid just barely got out of college, and he has got a great paying job with three weeks of vacation awesome okay he even uh, he even bragged about so they set him up in uh, specifically in an apartment that had google fiber built in in the event that he might need to work remote and sure enough covid happened and he's had to work remotely he's got google fiber internet he says is lightning fast just amazing now He's also built up an amazing nest egg. He is in the last year, year and a half since he started working, his expenses have been very low because he graduated college with very little college debt, if any. So he was able to focus on saving, saving, saving. And what he's been working on is saving for the down payment on a house. And I had asked him the detail. I said, so what's your current plan? What are you thinking? And he said, well, I'm, I'm working on saving 20% down. He figured the house will cost about $300,000. And that means he needs about $60,000 plus closing costs to get into a house. What's the, now that's the thing, right? He thought 20% down. And I said, well, where did you get 20% down from? And he said, well, people said that if I wanted to avoid private mortgage insurance that I need to put down at least 20%. And I said, well, that is true. However, you do qualify for an FHA first time home buying mortgage. So maybe having private mortgage insurance on there initially is more is less important than keeping more of your cash in the bank. So here's what we went through. We went through a conversation about the cash inside real estate. I want you to think about this question. How much money do you earn on the cash that you put inside a home? Let's say that we follow the Dave Ramsey advice and we pay cash. He has to wait forever to save up $300,000. How long is it gonna take him to save up $300,000? thousand dollars and what's going to happen to the price of houses it's going to go up and up and up now dave ramsey says pay cash for rental houses interesting he says it's okay to get a mortgage as long as it's on your primary home on your first home it's okay okay so we go get a mortgage so let's talk about five percent down versus twenty percent down because the, the Dave Ramsey plan and so many other financial entertainers and financial people in general will say, put down a good healthy down payment so you have a low monthly payment. Wait just a second. If, if this guy Ralph puts in $60,000 to buy the house, how much will he be earning on his $60,000 inside the house? The answer is zero. 
zero. The house will appreciate in value inevitably over time. It's in the Salt Lake Valley. It's, it's kind of the new Silicon Valley of the West. For sure, the value of his house will go up over time. But if you have money that you use to acquire the house, that money earns zero while it's in the house. Any cash or equity in the house is stagnant. It is not in and of itself earning a rate of return. Only the house, the real estate itself, earns a rate of return. Your dollars earn zero. The house goes up in value. For those of you listening on the podcast, I talk with my hands. I'm on YouTube. I'm actually moving my hands up and down and putting up the sign language, okay? So the cash inside real estate earns zero rate of return. The home will go up in value. So if that's the case, it's important to remember the three rules of real estate. The three rules of real estate, number one, buy it cheap. Get a good deal on it if you can. Get a good deal on it if you can. Maybe buy a home that, that needs a kitchen remodel or a home that has kind of an ugly front yard or something that could easily be fixed, but it's going to be perhaps less expensive because it's not that attractive, all right? Maybe. Number two, right? So buy it cheap. Number two, with other people's money. The second rule of real estate, in my opinion, should always be with other people's money. A good 30-year fixed rate mortgage using the bank's money to put inside the house. Because what did we say? How much interest do you earn on the cash inside a house? Zero. You earn zero on that cash. So why not put the bank's money in there to hold the asset? Oh, but Craig, then you have to pay interest. You have to pay interest on the loan. Yes, that's true. In today's interest rate market, he might only pay less than 4% interest on this loan. And when you consider that it's a tax deductible loan, his net effective interest rate might be three or 2%, right? Very low cost to actually control the asset using someone else's money. That's rule number two. Rule number three of real estate, in a good market. Now, you might have heard the idea, the rules of real estate, location, location, location. No, buy it cheap with other people's money in a good market. The location doesn't necessarily equate to better. The, the market could be in a rough neighborhood, but it's a good market for rental property that could be a great market. Now, in the case of Ralph, where he lives, it is a great market. Anywhere he is, within the vicinity of where he works, it's generally, over the next 20 years, an outstanding market, okay? What will Ralph end up with? Well, if he puts 5% down, he will keep more of his money in the bank safe in the event that he gets transferred to another division of the company, in the event that he has an emergency, in the event that something happens inevitably with a new home purchase, like he's gonna buy an older home in Salt Lake City, what if it needs an air conditioner? Wouldn't it be great if he had kept the bulk of his money in liquidity for emergencies and opportunities? You see, that's the key. Buying a home, especially a first time home buyer, you just don't know what's gonna come up. So keeping more liquidity in the bank, absolutely a good idea, and getting as little money necessary for the down payment, totally awesome. So my suggestions to Ralph, use a first time home buying mortgage, absolutely. Get the lowest possible down payment. Yes, he may end up with private mortgage insurance, but consider buying a duplex. Consider buying a three unit or a two unit or a four unit property because his income will support a bit more of an expensive purchase. But if you've got a one or two renters in your duplex or your triplex, they're paying the mortgage. That's the brilliant part for him. 
he really works quite a bit and he works in the office, so why not get a duplex? Why not consider having renters take care of the mortgage payment? Now, if he buys that, right, the tenants are covering him. Then, really important, put the minimum down payment so that he can keep his liquid money safe. I love this phrase from a friend of mine in my company, keep your powder dry. Keep the powder dry, keep that liquid money safe and let the bank's money hold the asset, right? Remember, the bank's money is in the house and yes, there's some interest, but dollar for dollar, it's much smarter for Ralph to keep that liquidity for the first few years of owning a property so that he's ready for emergencies and opportunities. And what if he gets tagged by another company and he's invited for a pay raise to go to a different company, right? And now he's not in the Salt Lake City area anymore. Well, wouldn't it be awesome if he had a home that was a perfect rental platform and he had liquid money to be able to adjust and move to another place and maybe buy another house, right? Wouldn't it be great if he was able to just simply turn that first property into a rental property and because he's got a good fixed rate 30 year mortgage on it, all he has to do is put a, a tenant in there and the tenant covers the cost of the mortgage and then he can move to the next job, right? That's the idea is not to get sucked into this idea that, oh, you gotta have a 15 year mortgage, you gotta pay it off fast. No, 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 no. 30 year mortgage, fixed rate, period. And as little down in the house as possible, especially for a 25 year old. It is more important than ever at 25, especially as a new homeowner, to be prepared for fixes and repairs and maybe relocating or what if you just want to spontaneously travel somewhere and you you want to go for a year abroad and just rent out the house wouldn't it be great if you had a very low monthly payment but you had liquidity in your bank account to have the freedom to choose you've got to have the right balance if you've got a question about buying your first home second home or your 25th home please send me an email craig with a k at craigstrom.com, Craig with a K, at craigstrom.com. Now, I mentioned something early that I wanna, I wanna touch on. This is just a kind of a little bonus piece that I thought of when I was talking to Ralph, is that I mentioned that he came out of college with very little college debt, right? This side note about his great paying career. Well, he went to a community college for a lot of his general education stuff. He went to the community college route to take care of some of the stuff that he didn't need to pay full-blown college retail. Remember my deal of the week segment, don't pay retail. College university is retail. He went to the local community college for a, basically a discounted price on all of the basic classes that he needed and then transferred those in to the software engineering program at the university that he wanted to go to. So he was able to come out of school with very little debt, very little debt, uh, largely because he got a big chunk of his schooling done at the community college level, and he was able to work through that while he was getting it done, with a little help from his family and so forth. So keep that in mind, uh, this kid, comes out with virtually no debt and gets an awesome career start uh, from a big international defense contractor. And he doesn't have a hundred or $200,000 of college debt to pay off from some big name university. Bonus, so he can go out shopping for a house. So Ralph, fantastic job. Get out there and happy hunting. Again, if you've got a question about this or anything related to retirement or investments or whatever it might be, Send me an email, Craig with a K at craigstrom.com. Take care.